Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your evidence, which I've uh, found extremely powerful uh, today and about the best evidence I've heard uh, so far throughout this entire inquiry. I'm not a smoker. I've never smoked in my life. But uh, this debate is all about where people can or cannot uh, vape, if that's the uh, word we're using these days. Um, I, I can imagine the right-wing press having a field day, because if I went to the, um, uh, the stadium tonight to support Wales, I wouldn't be allowed to uh, use an e-cigarette, but I could if I was in jail, um, which I, I find um, uh, unusual, but uh, there you go. Um, I, I want to ask a question about vaping in cars. Um, how um, we know that smoking in cars is exceptionally dangerous, and we know that uh, it's going to be banned if you have children in, in the cars now. But what about vaping in cars with the children? So we don't have any studies of vaping in cars with children, um, so we don't have that evidence. But I think we know the evidence of the risk from secondhand vapor in close proximity, and the evidence we have at the moment is that it is minimal to bystanders. Mm -hmm. um, so I, wouldn't, I don't think we would be advocating extending your smoke-free cars uh, legislation which we welcome, which came in today, yeah. to include e-cigarettes. But as John says, it's an etiquette thing, and I think the public realize that there are certain circumstances, and vapors realize, where it's potentially not the best thing to use an e-cigarette. And it may well be that in a, in a car as an environment they choose not to do so. But we, we don't have any studies okay. looking at cars. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. John? Chair, I just wanted to come back briefly to um, what I think Linda mentioned. Um, particularly which is the, the worry that um, if um, the ban on smoking um, in public places was extended to e-cigarettes, it would send an unfortunate message that um, e-cigarettes um, were as harmful as tobacco products. Because I just think there are powerful drivers um, that thankfully are pushing people from tobacco use to e-cigarette use. Um, the health benefits is a major one, but also cost. And, um, you know, then... It seems to me that most people surely would understand, particularly people who smoke and must be aware of the health, um, the health uh, impact of smoking, that a switch to e-cigarettes would greatly benefit their health and they would also get the great financial benefits. It does seem very odd to me that you know, there would be many people in the, in the category, Linda, that um, you know, would, be a f would take from um, this proposed legislation were it enacted that um, because they were no longer able to use electronic cigarettes in public places, they must be equally as harmful as um, smoking tobacco. I, I would have thought, you know, the vast majority of uh, people, including smokers, are far more intelligent than that. Well, if I start, and I'm sure John can, can add a lot to the, the response. Unfortunately, I think we only have to look internationally to find those examples. So what you're proposing is a change in the regulatory environment, a, a, a policy change that will send a message that e-cigarettes are like tobacco. That's how I, I see it, and that's what Cancer Research UK has said in their evidence. We have two other countries where we can look at. Now, the first one is Italy. And what Italy have done is they have used a fiscal measure. They've put a tax on e-cigarettes in the same way as tobacco. And when they did that, and that's an, you know, a single policy measure, the numbers of Italians vaping has dropped significantly. And the same thing has happened in Spain. It's not a tax, but they've uh, regulated the retail environment in Spain. And the number of people vaping has changed dramatically. And they've also had health scares in the media about them. So my, my, my fear, you're right, there are positive drivers to support people to use e-cigarettes, and I accept that. But my concern is that if you introduce a non-evidence-based additional policy measure, you create additional confusion, and you, you uh, take away the potential that people will switch. So I think that, you know, that additional measure potentially would have negative outcomes. And before you come yeah. here, can I just clarify one point? You said the number of, in those two countries have dropped. Yeah are taking uh, e-cigarettes. Has therefore the numbers of smoking stayed the same or, or has that sort of gone down as well? Because the intention is to obviously to transfer. So, I, I mean, in terms of the Spanish smoking rates, those have stalled and there may be a number of reasons for that in Spain that may not be to do with the e-cigarettes. I'm not, I can't immediately recall what the change has been in tobacco smoking rates in Italy, but I am very clear that the, um, and John can probably speak to this, that the number of vapors has changed because of a change in the regulatory environment. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I've never been a smoker, but I I'm a respiratory physician. Nearly all of the people I see in my clinic are, are smokers or have been smokers. 
and, and I spend a lot of time talking to them about why they smoke or why they continue to smoke and why they don't heed the health messages and so on. And in terms of electronic cigarettes, um, it, I hear very frequently, well, of course, they say they're just as bad as real cigarettes. And that's sort of presented as a reason why the smoker hasn't tried an electronic cigarette. And I think, from what I understand of the smoker's uh, psyche, and, and, and you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Davis, said you were a smoker at one point, so maybe this rings true, is that being a smoker and knowing that you don't, we'd rather not be a smoker, and you're probably harming your health and harming the health of others, and you're a lot poorer and so on, as a consequence you smoke, is all horrible, and it'd be nice to get out of it, but actually getting out of it is quite a frightening prospect stopping and do going through that. So any excuse that comes along that will allow you to put off stopping. Yes, I'm going to stop, but not until I've got through this divorce or not until I've got past Christmas. Or There's always a reason to put it off. And so a mixed <laughs> message after the election. Um, I almost became a smoker on Saturday night, actually. Um, uh, anything that gives that mixed message helps to perpetuate that idea, well, maybe it's not the right product for me now. I think our, my role in, in clinical and in public health, and I would hope the role of government, is to give people clear messages where they can about the risks that they take in their choices and to set up a regulatory framework which supports that perception. And I think that by taking a strong line of electronic cigarettes in public, you may be going the wrong way. The time is almost up. Can I just ask uh, two quick questions? I understand the, the concerns you've pointed out, and you've identified perhaps a bit in that the majority of people are courteous and don't vape or use e-cigarettes in more public, most public places. Mm. And therefore, it could be that a ban wouldn't actually have a major impact upon those individuals. But your concern, if I'm right, is that it's, it's a message that gives, it gives out more than anything else. Mm. It's, there's two things. One is the message, sorry, Lynn. There's the message which is crucially important, but then there's also the issue, yes, I agree, you could, of, of, of those areas where it might be quite useful to be able to allow electronic cigarettes. And my worry would be there's a legislative structure that determined where you can and can't may not be as flexible as something that works on courtesy. We're all aware of environments where, I mean, my own local pub, electronic cigarettes were used for a while and then eventually the landlady said look I'm sick of this you, know, you can go outside with all the others it's, it was just sorted out as a local issue it wasn't necessary to have law to sort that out and similarly in a, in a prison or in a mental health setting or on my hospital ward I would like to think that if it's the right thing for somebody to be able to use an electronic cigarette they could without fear of prosecution okay and can I have one final point on perhaps your, your expertise here We've, we haven't discussed it at all today, but the issue of perhaps third-hand smoking, um, because the part of the concern bill is actually talking about workplaces which may be people's homes, and therefore an individual going into work in someone's home where there may be a residue of particularly smoke, um, tobacco products, as, as the smoking issue, but e-cigarettes. Is there uh, an issue in relation to third-hand smoke? Uh, I th personally, I think the third-hand smoke issue is is a very minor risk um, and so it's not something <coughs> I've given a great deal of concern about given the magnitude of the risks of second and first yeah. hand. Um, electronic cigarettes provide an opportunity again so I look after people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease we have NHS staff who go out and visit them in their homes and who need a smoke free environment to work in. Electronic cigarettes are a potential solution to that. Okay, okay well thank you for no other questions. Mm. Quick, quick question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there, uh, do you think there will be any harmful effect in coming years? Uh, is there any predictability, uh, knowing you are doing so much research, uh, respiratory diseases you are seeing every day in and out? Well, it, it took us a long time to work out what tobacco does. Uh, and you never know the long-term effect of anything that millions of people use for decades until millions of people have used them for decades, particularly rare adverse effects. If we look at what's in electronic cigarette vapor, we would expect, I would expect, sorry, a spectrum of disease 
similar to that of smoking in its core components. So I would expect a small increase in cancer risk. I would expect damage to the lung, perhaps driving emphysema, possibly some fibrotic lung disease, and possibly some cardiovascular risk from absorbed particulates. But in magnitude terms, trivial. So I think there will be, just as there will be, a child that becomes a smoker only because they had access to electronic cigarettes, but it's probably going to be one, two, five, or ten in the whole country, whole UK. There may be one or two cases of those diseases caused by electronic cigarette use, which in relation to the problem we have from tobacco is trivial. Yeah, I think it is absolutely about the relative risk. I think that is a key issue for this committee to consider and also to continue to support you know, the really high quality research that we do across the UK on these issues as we have in the past for smoking. That's what we're trying to do now for electronic cigarettes so that we can look and know what's going on in the future and you know, create evidence-based policy on that basis as well. I am sure that whichever way the committee goes, they will continually, continually look at the research and evidence in relation to this matter. Can I thank you both for your evidence thank this you morning? Thank you very much. Uh, you will receive a transcript of the you receive a copy of the transcript for any factual inaccuracies. If you spot any, please let us know so Thank we can you. correct them straight away for the record. Thank you once again. Thanks very, very much indeed. Thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, I propose we have a break now.